We're absolutely delighted to have Pat Dorsey here with us today. Pat Dorsey is the founder of Dorsey Asset Management, which manages concentrated global portfolios for institutional investors. Prior to starting Dorsey Asset Management, Pat Dorsey was the director of research for Sanibel Captiva Trust, an independent trust company with approximately $1 billion in assets under management, serving high net worth clients. From 2000 to 2011, Pat Dorsey was director of equity research for Morningstar, where he led the growth of Morningstar's equity research group from 10, from 10 analysts to over 100 analysts. He developed Morningstar's economic moat ratings, as well as the methodology behind Morningstar's framework for analyzing competitive advantages. Pat Dorsey is also the author of two books, The Five Rules for Successful Stock Investing and The Little Book That Builds Wealth. He holds a master's degree in political science from Northwestern University and a bachelor's degree in government from Wesleyan University. Thank you for joining us today, Pat. You bet. Excellent. So let's uh, dive into the presentation. All right. So uh, thanks for having me. We'll uh, chat for maybe 20, 25 minutes and then we'll take questions. Uh, it's always much more interesting to hear what other people want to say than what I have to say myself. Um, so what I want to talk about today is thinking about competitive advantage in a forward looking sense. I think we're all used to thinking about competitive advantages. Let's look at what the company has done. Let's look at published financials. Um, but this is kind of modes 2.0 and thinking about competitive advantage from a forward-looking perspective, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters, because as equity investors, we get paid on the future. We don't get paid on the past. Um, so, you know, quick introduction, uh, Dorsey Asset Management, we're about a billion and change assets under management, uh, largely institutional clients, six employees, very concentrated, uh, currently have 14 positions. Um, we focus on businesses with economic moats, reinvestment runways, and our process emphasizes primary research and qualitative insights. And you're gonna hear this come up a lot in the presentation, the idea of qualitative insights from customers, from former employees, really informing a lot of the work we do. And I think it's kind of what you have to do to inform any kind of a forward-looking analysis of competitive advantage. So super quick, we'll start off with just sort of moat basics, moats 1.0. Uh, so what creates a moat? You know, the, the, the primary test is pricing power. You know, which is usually created via tangible assets like a brand or a patent or a license, the switching costs, network effects, or cost advantages. And moats, in our view, matter because they increase business value. They lengthen the period during which capital can be reinvested at a very high incremental rate of return. You know, they can also reduce business risk by insulating the business from competition and exogenous shocks. And here's the key part for us active managers, they can be inefficiently priced because a go forward analysis of a competitive advantage as opposed to a backward looking one requires qualitative analysis. You can't just rely on the numbers. And reinvestment matters. This is where the forward looking sort of most 2.0 stuff comes in because it maximizes the value of competitive advantage and it lowers the risk of value destructive capital allocation. Let's give an example. So company A has 20% returns on capital. Pretty good. It reinvests 30% of its cash flow, probably because its end market isn't growing very quickly, right? Probably because its end market is just not super high growth. So it can only the business itself can only absorb 30% of its cash flow. The other 70% gets used for dividends and buybacks and MA. Sounds great until we consider that, first of all, only a third of the cash flow actually earns 20% returns on capital which is kind of what attracted us to the business in the first place. Also, we have real potential for value destruction. Most companies do not repurchase opportunistically at low prices. They just repurchase to sop up options dilution at whatever price it happens to be in the market. And M&A has got a pretty sketchy track record. You know, some businesses that really focus on it get it right, but they're the minority. And so odds are pretty good Big chunks of that cash flow are either being used on low NPV, you know, negative NPV acquisitions, or maybe neutral NPV acquisitions. Dividends are fine, but if they get paid to me, I have to redeploy that capital in a very competitive public equity market, right? Um, I got to go out there and find something to do with it. And if it's in a taxable account, I get leakage, right? I get those dividends are taxed. So now let's consider company B. Same return on capital, right? 20% returns on capital, but the end market is growing at a rapid enough pace, or it has the opportunity to take market share such that 
it can reinvest 70% of its cash flow. Now, the bulk of the cash flow actually earns the return on capital that attracted us to the business in the first place. This is pretty good. We also have a lower capital allocation risk because the capital is reinvested. There's no hard decisions. Management doesn't have to say, okay, who do we buy to improve our growth rate or defend our moat? There's one decision, put it back in the business. Reduces your risk as an investor. Your return on the reinvestment is higher than what's typically achievable in public equity markets. And this is the key point, that the set of companies with sustainable returns on capital above 20% is way bigger than this set of equity managers with long-term net returns above 20%. So it's just a more efficient way to deploy the cash. For me as an investor, if they can take that money and put it back in the business, they're probably gonna earn a better return than I can trying to redeploy that in a competitive public equity market. Um, that's just math. <laughs> so how do we analyze reinvestment? So first of all, when you want to think about whether the uh, reinvestment is sort of positive or negative NPV and what the risk of it is, think about whether it's incremental or fixed, right? If you're launching satellites, Starlink, Iridium, Global Star, building a giant factory, well, you get no cash flow until the investment is fully deployed. And so if the world changes between the time you dig the foundation and the time you're pumping out the first product, or if you run out of money or whatever happens, you're kind of in a bad place as an investor because it's a fixed investment that until it's complete, you get, you're getting no cash flow. Compare that to hiring developers or hiring salespeople where you can kind of, you know, if you hire a whole bunch of salespeople, sales aren't going so well, well, you can slow your hiring or fire up, right? A lot easier to fire them than it is to basically, you know, not pay the construction guys who are building your big, big old factory. So that incremental investment, investment that can be ramped up or ramped down, usually has a little bit of a lower risk profile for you as the investor than a big lumpy investment that has to be made in its entirety before you generate any cash flow. The corollary here is that fungible assets like people are easier to pivot than fixed assets. Because sometimes the original plan doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, you can tell the developer, hey, instead of developing software with features A, B, and C, hmm, develop softwares with features Q, X, and Z, because that's maybe what the market actually wants. Whereas if you're building a giant factory to produce widgets and the world don't want widgets, you're kind of stuck with a widget making battery. You also need to think about the, the possible competitive response. If you're reinvesting heavily, well, you poke the bear, it might poke back. Slack discovered this with Microsoft. Microsoft declared Slack an existential threat. Uh, and so, you know, teams got a lot better, a lot faster. Um, and then also think about whether you're widening or marketing a moat versus digging a new one. It's easier and less risky to do a product extension than just create something out of whole cloth or for the business to pivot into a direction it's never gone in before. You also want to think about the fact that investment happens on the income state. And this is super important because things like sales or advertising or development costs, GAAP considers them expenses. However, the accounting rules may not match economic reality. It's pretty hard to argue, for example, that every developer on, in AWS, everything they're doing has zero value after 1231.22. That's just, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> I think that'd be a hard argument to make, right? And so some proportion of uh, what a, develop a software developer is doing, although it's expensed, is probably an investment that's going to bring a benefit in future years. Ditto with marketing costs to some extent. If you're acquiring customers that might have a five, six, seven year lifetime, average life, well, again, the definition of an investment is spending money today for a benefit that occurs over future periods. Well, that sounds like a benefit that occurs over future periods because that customer is going to pay me for five or seven years. And so what this kind of boils down to is that you as the analyst need to make the choice about whether an expense is an investment that's going to be a build future value or just a frivolous burning of cash flow. Gap isn't going to do this analysis for you. You have to do it yourself. But the core question here is just to think about, you know, how is a factory which sits on a balance sheet and depreciates, why is that more valuable 
than a brand or a group of sticky customers, which are expensed, right? The, the, the effort to acquire. So it's just, the key here is just, you need to think about categories of expenses that are really investments when you're thinking about long-term margins and you're thinking about, you know, whether the uh, investment is NPV positive or NPV negative. The corollary here is that gap losses don't mean something is a bad business. Um, you know, again, are some expenses really investments? Are cash flows actually higher than gap income? And with options, uh, options being expensed or negative working capital businesses, I mean, I can think of a few businesses with, you know, the gap losses are hundreds of millions, but their cash flow break even, right? And so if your cash flow break even, you're just not as risky a business <laughs> as if you're actually burning hundreds of millions of cash. And then critically, you know, are structural long run margins actually higher than current margins? You know, so if a business is losing money because it's a high cost steel mill and will always be a high cost steel mill, it's a bad business, okay? <laughs> if it's losing money today because it's expensing options, because it's reinvesting in customers with an eight or 10 year lifetime value, well, it may still be a bad business, but it may not. You gotta do the work to figure that out. And so the corollary here is that quantitative network metrics may be of little value in analyzing whether investments actually NPV positive, especially because in a digital world, if the invested capital is minimal, companies making really bad reinvestment decisions may have high returns on capital, right? If, you have, if your invested capital is a rented office and a bunch of servers, uh, probably not even a bunch of servers now if you're using AWS, um, you know, oh gee, you've got this wonderfully high return on capital. It doesn't mean anything because the denominator is a meaningless number, right? Um, so don't get lured into, oh, this is a high ROIC business that must be good. Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, and, and also if high NPV reinvestment is expensed, a declining return on capital may indicate a brighter future, not a worse one, right? If you're investing in what's gonna be a really great product, that's gonna generate a lot of value in the future. And again, the qualitative research methods are probably gonna produce more robust answers than navel gazing at, you know, gap income statements. Another corollary is that, and I wanna be clear about this, just because a business has limited reinvestment opportunity, it's not a bad business, right? I mean, Nestle is not a bad business. Um, it, does, it just means that capital allocation takes on greater importance as a source of value creation and destruction, right? You, as the analyst, have to spend more time thinking about, well, what is management going to do with all that cash that they can't plow back into the business because the business just isn't growing that quickly. The end market just isn't growing. You know, destructive M&A is your biggest risk and consistently successful M&A requires real focus. Some companies are good at it, many are not. Um, so again, it's, I don't want to imply that if you can't reinvest all your cash flow, oh, it's a terrible investment, you should never look at it. It just means your analytical focus needs to be different, right? Your analytical focus needs to put more emphasis on capital allocation than it would in a business where the capital allocation decision is basically one decision put the money back in the business. And so, again, circling back to the idea of the, what the numbers do and don't tell you, you know, in a mature industry that generally capitalizes investments, the backward looking quantitative evidence, once you get out of Cap IQ or Bloomberg or whatever, it may suffice to assess competitive advantage, right? Because the accounting rules actually have, kind of match economic reality, right? The ROIC actually has analytical value if the company's building a factory, depreciating it over some, you know, useful life, and that useful life roughly matches, you know, in the, with the depreciation schedule, roughly matches reality, right? The past may be a decent guide to the future. The problem, of course, is that the evidence is there for everyone to see. The mode is probably is more, let's just say more likely, maybe not probably, more likely to be efficiently priced. Because what you can see, everybody else can see. Anybody with Gap IQ or Bloomberg or who just wants to spend time typing, filing data into a spreadsheet. Um, but in a dynamic industry, 
growing industry that usually expenses its investments, software would be one example, there are many, this past quantitative data has much more limited value because ROIC is meaningless if there's not much invested capital to begin with and if the investments are often expensed. The numbers doesn't tell you anything at all. And if the, also, if the industry is changing rapidly, the past may be a really bad guide to the future. Herein, though, lies the opportunity. Because if the moat is not obvious to some quant running a screen, or some you know, newly minted wet behind the years MBA who's just staring at past financial statements, you can develop a variant perception by doing the work, by using qualitative insights. A little quick case study for you. Um, so it's a company called Avalara um, that makes sales tax compliance software. Um, the US has about 12,000 taxing jurisdictions. Uh, there was a decision by the Supreme Court, or SCOTUS, a few years back that basically um, changed the rules for when states can tax companies from physical nexus, meaning you got to have a warehouse here, to economic nexus, meaning as long as you're doing a certain amount of business here, we can tax you. Uh, of course, with e-commerce, there's lots and lots more businesses that have economic nexus than physical nexus. So this company does sales tax software. We're like, hey, demand might go up for this stuff. Let's take a look at it. So key questions, you know, what's the competitive landscape? What are the switching costs? What's the shape of the adoption curve? How big is the addressable market for this? And what's the long-term margin profile of the business? So what do we do? Well, first we built what's called, we thought was called the Wayfair Index, which was basically, Wayfair was the name of the court decision. Uh, basically trying to look at each state and what the population of that state was and then when it was scheduled to implement um, economic nexus. So you get some sense of kind of when states and businesses in those states would kind of be forced to uh, have some kind of sales tax compliance solution to implement. Sourced competitors, partners, ex-employees, spoke with over a three period, several former employees, competitors, consultants, ERP partners, and did a whole bunch of customer calls. And so the key insights from that was first of all, it was a very benign competitive landscape. They pretty much they had one competitor at the low end, which if you were bigger than a 10 person company, I was really gonna use it. And then they had another competitor who was much more focused on big, big enterprises that of course have been paying taxes in multiple states for decades, right? Because they have employees all over the place. But that software wasn't very flexible and it really wasn't very modern and it really, wasn't easily adopted by kind of your modal, small, uh, sort of medium-sized business. Um, we discovered that the ERP integrations were critical to the moat, that basically they, Alvalara had spent a lot of time partnering with pretty much lot, you know, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of ERP providers and making it easy to hook up to that system. Because if the system that is recording your sales and recording your inventory and doing your general ledger can't talk to the sales tax compliance software, it's of no value, right? And so these systems have to talk to each other. And if Avalara can show up and say, hey, we've already got this integration. We built it out years ago. And we got a bunch of clients using it. That's a much easier, much, much easier sell than, oh uh, yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> you know, maybe. Um, switching costs are very high, as you might imagine. It's a little bit like the payroll industry, right? If you think about like, pay companies like uh, Paycom or Paylocity or, or back in the day Paychex or ADP, you know, basically you don't pay much for someone to calculate your payroll in the taxes that you owe. But if you get it wrong, you have this, these guys called the IRS, they really ask angry at you and you don't like that. Uh, this is the same thing, you know, relative to the cost of this software to keep a whole bunch of states happy that, you know, we're actually filing our taxes on time. It's pretty low relative to the risk that, you know, three state comptrollers call you up next year and say, yeah, you didn't file your taxes here. You got some penalties. Oh, we're gonna audit you. you know, not something you want as a business. Um, and we also felt that operating leverage would be substantial because this is a volume-based business. So more sales get taxed, you know, e-commerce in many, many states. Um, you know, your cost of goods sold doesn't really rise with incremental volume, right? I mean, you're just, you're just doing a quick little calculation on what sales tax you have. And then, so the higher ARPU creates revenue with minimal sales and marketing cost. And so the, the, the nut here, and I just boiled down several weeks of work into about 90 seconds, um, is the, the, what you want to do as an analyst is you're bounding future uncertainty using a wide variety of qualitative and quantitative sources. 
you want to think investigative journalism, not billions or Wall Street, right? Um, that's what a great analyst does. Um, they really are much more of an investigative journalist than they are a dude with a Bloomberg shouting orders at a trader. Um, that looks much better on TV because it, it just, it's more photogenic than like reading a 10K or talking to a customer, uh, but it's just, it's not how value actually gets created in the market. Um, and so what I wanna wrap up with is just emphasizing the value of qual qualitative insight because the outputs of competitive advantage and reinvestment and capital allocation, those outputs might be quantitative, but the inputs require qualitative evaluation because you can't screen for switching costs. You have to go talk to customers to understand the value proposition. You cannot assume reinvestment is NPV positive. You have to analyze the long run economics yourself. And you cannot rely on the warm comfort of published GAF numbers. You have to go out into the real world, gather messy and conflicting qualitative evidence, piece together a mosaic, and make a forecast that may look very different than the past. It's called sticking your neck out. Um, and it's really, really hard to do. But frankly, it's the way that you generate alpha in this business. Because if you're looking at the same published data that everybody else is, odds that you're going to come to a variant perception really aren't that high. So the big message here is to turn up your laptops. Because all of the information is in the past, all the value is in the future. It's a quote from Bill Miller. The quantitative data is usually priced pretty efficiently because everyone's got it. A qualitative insight that you worked hard to go out and get yourself, that is going to be less efficiently priced because nobody else has it. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. I think that's a really, really excellent presentation. Uh, do you use screens at all even to just source a list of companies or do you have other ways for sourcing these companies? The screen's only gonna tell you what's already happened, right? Um, and if you're looking at the screen, somebody else look at the same screen. So the sourcing is very idiosyncratic. Um, you know, I think the best thing you can do to source ideas um, is first of all, don't think of them as ideas. Think of them as businesses, right? Because you know, if you start getting hooked on ideas, what happens is, first of all, you kind of can go down this path on, I would say, sort of a low ROI path, because you're going to learn all this stuff about a business, then that knowledge is not leverageable over future businesses, right? Because it's a, some special situation, something that's unique to that case. Um, whereas if you think about just learning businesses, and you say, wow, I think this industry has pretty attractive economics, and I'm going to start with this company here, then I'm going to look at its supplier, and I'm going to look at its customers, and then I'm going to look at its distributors. What you're doing then is each new bit of work you do builds on the prior bit of work you did, right? And you're creating information, knowledge rather, with a long half-life to it, right? That, that's going to take a long time to expire. Uh, and I think that especially when you're beginning in this business, um, people tend to take a shotgun approach. They sort of get excited by an idea they read or, you know, they heard some manager talk about it or whatever. Uh, and then they kind of look at a software business and they look at an aerospace supplier. And like, you know, I mean, they're just like stretched really thin. It just, the better way to do it is just pick something um, and then kind of spider out from there, learn about that industry ecosystem. Um, and then, you know, maybe it's a good investment, maybe it's not. Um, and then move on, you know, learn something else. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And for our next question, overall, compared to in the past, do you believe that it is getting easier for companies to maintain their moats as a result of global scale or harder for companies to maintain their moats because of the rapid pace of technological change? You know, CPG companies, you know, for years and years, you know, the two biggest parts of their moat were first of all brands, right? They could spend a ton of money on linear TV um, to generate, you know, consumer awareness. And they had these distribution advantages because to get the stuff, you had to go to a grocery store, right? And it just took a long time to build it out. Well, now let's fast forward to 2022. Um, first of all, the barriers to entry for advertising and con generating consumer awareness are way lower today than 15, 20 years ago, because you can, you know, put up a digital ad that's just targeted to, you know, left-handed mothers with red-haired babies or whatever, um, you know, just, you know, just focus on them. Um, you couldn't do that 15, 20 years ago, right? So the barrier to entry for, to generate consumer awareness, so much lower than it used to be. Um, and then distribution, someone else can do it for you. You know, you can use fulfillment on Amazon, 
you can you know, do it yourself. There's so many more shipping services available today. E-commerce is you know, you know, used by most people where it wasn't 15, 20 years ago. So you know, none of those companies are gonna destroy you know, Campbell Soup or, or something. But with, you know, when you think about most CPG markets, they're growing really slow. And so if lots of lots of these hyper-targeted competitors that are satisfying some niche or, or some or speaking to some type of value that a small group of customers have. And they're just picking off, you know, 10 bips of market share here, five bips of market share there. Well, when you're only your own three to four percent to begin with, it's not fun. Um, so I mean I guess that's it's not that's not a statement about you know whether the world is changing faster or more rapidly. It's more a statement around you know the past is just irrelevant. Um, what has happened just doesn't really, has happened kind of doesn't matter. Um, so I guess I'm just, I'm reluctant to generalize. I mean, you get all this kind of stuff around, oh, moats aren't nearly as durable as they used to be. And I think some of that comes from people who like own newspapers that then got, just got destroyed, um, you know, or, or people who are seeing what's happening in CPG, these sort of long time, very stable industries that are kind of, you know, not having a great time right now. Um, but I don't know what that means that, like competitive advantage is eroding faster all over the place, right? I mean, network effects are easier to generate today than they used to be. You know, 15, 20 years ago, there were, for, in terms of network effect businesses, you had like MasterCard, Visa, and the financial exchanges. It's kind of what you had, right? Um, but now with, you know, with social networking and with um, payment systems, it's just, you've got way more businesses with that type of mode, which, again, generalizing tends to be harder to destroy. So technology cuts both ways. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And how about we speak a little bit about how did you initially become interested in investing? And did you always feel that a sort of more moat self investing was the right path for you? Or did you have some time where you were debating between, let's say, a moat type of investing and a more deep value style of investing? Yeah, I mean, I'm not one of those guys who was like reading the intelligent investor in high school. Um, I mean, I, we, we just finished our interviewing for interns. And I mean, some of these, I'm like, if I was the smartest you at that age, I'd be running the world right now. Um, I mean, like they're just so far ahead of me. And I mean, I, I didn't really, no one even introduced me to, you know, common stocks, uncommon profits until I was in my late twenties when I was at Morningstar. Uh, before that, I just thought of businesses as little blinky things with charts attached to them. You know, quote the man. Um, so, you know, I was kind of later in life and when I finally figured out that, you know, investing was about understanding businesses, it wasn't about kind of, you know, all this flashing screen stuff. Um, and the, the competitive, the competitive advantage angle of it, um, there's a couple of things. I mean, one, my background, uh, in both graduate school and undergrad, uh, was in comparative politics, which is basically studying a small number of cases um of, you know usually usually you know historical events or or, or um things that have happened with with countries and then trying to extrapolate meaning from a small number of well understood case studies um well it sounds kind of like invest <laughs> study five or six businesses and try to understand the similarities and develop pattern recognition it's like wow well, maybe i could actually figure this out um and i just find it like to me it's just much more intellectually interesting to understand how a business how does something well enough that it, consumers allow it to extract excess economic rents over and over and over and over again. Like that's just a really interesting challenge. And then how did the business solve that challenge? Like, I just find that much more intellectually interesting than like the kind of jigsaw puzzle aspect of, you know, recharacterizing a balance sheet so that, you know, the, you, know you, you, you write up the buildings that are carried on at a cost and then you go out and find out their market value. And again, that's not, I don't mean to disparage that at all. Like that's a kind of, you know, financial sleuthing that can generate a lot of value. It's just, I, I don't find it very fun. Uh, and so I find it much more interesting to understand the, just the functioning of the business and, and why it does or does not create excess value over time. Like that's just to me, it's a really interesting question and the answer is different for every business pretty much. Um, so I just find that much more interesting than, you know, kind of the, the 
mechanical finance, again, mechanical sounds pejorative and I don't mean it that way, than kind of the, the more quantitative financial analysis. Sure. And uh, you spoke also earlier about that you're sort of um, interviewing some interns right now. Sort of what is your advice for students who dream of interning at Dorsey Asset Management? Uh, what types of backgrounds or qualities or characteristics is the company looking for? Well, unfortunately, first of all, you got to live in Chicago because we, 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 have, we employ them during the school year, too. So that's kind of hard. Uh, so I'll just uh, before I get some flood of applications. Um, but <clears throat> what I would say is that, and th this applies whether you want to intern anywhere, um, what's going to separate the sheep from the goats um, are first of all good communication skills. Um, and you know, I would say every shop is different, but I would say that if you can demonstrate good primary research skills, um, you will stand out from your from the peers, right? I mean, if, you know, this, this candidate is pitching Airbus and they provided some wonderful analysis of, you know, competitive landscape between the A320 and the 737 and blah, 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 um, and subsidies of the US government and of the European governments, whatever. Um, and then this person over here has looked at, I don't know, just, you know, some five billion market cap software company but actually went out and talked to like five customers of it, right? And understood why it's useful, why it's not useful, right? Maybe they've managed to find, find an ex-salesperson, talk to them and understand, okay, you know, what did people, when you didn't win the deal, what did people choose? That guy's gonna stand out. That guy's gonna stand out way more than the one who basically put together some super sophisticated analysis that honestly anyone could have put together, right? Anyone with kind of table stakes skills. This one's actually did what I would call the hard work because, you know, getting in touch with 30 people and having to respond to you is not a lot of fun. It's hard, um, but you're more likely to get insights that fewer, fewer people have. Uh, and so I think as a, as a candidate, you're more likely to stand out uh, if you've done that. Now, again, your mileage may vary. If you're applying to some shop that just wants you to model all day long, having called five customers, they may not care. They're just going to care about how fast can you whip through an Excel sheet. So don't, don't, don't take what I'm saying as gospel truth. And um, how important do you think either a MBA or a CFA is within the investment management industry and particularly within the value investing? But look, I mean, I think there's, there are plenty of smart people who, you know, they kind of started out in private equity or iBanking, and then they use the MBA to kind of pivot because you know, a lot of folks are recruiting out of MBA, you know, buy side shops are recruiting out of MBA programs. Um, but then there are plenty of folks who they kind of just we wangled their way into the profession um, and didn't need the MBA. You know, I, I don't know that the skills one learns in an MBA are all that valuable to becoming a great investor. They may be a useful doorway to getting into the industry and that there's value there, right? Uh, and they may help you build a network of people that then you can contact in the future. That that has value too. But I can think of tons and tons of great investors who've never been anywhere near business school. Um, so I think the choice is much more about what helps you as an individual get to where you want to go in the industry uh, than it is about building skills. Um, CFA, I think, is more important on the skill building front, but I wouldn't say it's required. Uh, again, I know plenty of smart folks without CFAs, but I think that if you if you are trying to enter the profession from a non-finance background, as I did, uh, if you're coming from more of a liberal arts background, um, then I think the CFA is really important because what it demonstrates is that you have table stakes level skills, right? You've kind of gotten the basics down that somebody else might have gotten as a finance undergrad, right? Um, and even if you've acquired some of those skills on your own, it's like a union card, right? I mean, it sort of says, okay, there's some basic stuff that I know. So again, it, it, given the choice, I think your ROI on, on a CFA is way higher, especially because it's way less expensive than <laughs> MBA. Uh, but I don't want to disparage MBA. I mean, I've never gotten one, so I can't speak super knowledgeably about MBAs. I, all I can say is that I don't think the skills one learns there are super, are super valuable to becoming a good investor. They may be valuable to getting into the investing field, um, just based on your own background uh, and based on kind of your own path in life. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. And we spoke during the presentation about a successful investment that you made in the past. Can you speak about an investment that failed that you made in the past and sort of what went wrong and what was your thesis for it? Sure. I mean, and I put that in there to only be, I mean, actually, I didn't even say it was successful, did I? Uh, you don't know that it was successful. Uh, <laughs> It turned out that it was, but I, I didn't say that. Uh, I, mean, I just put it in there as kind of an example of kind of our process. Um, I mean, look, we've we've had so many mistakes. I can't even I can't even begin to talk about it. I mean, one in particular is probably Yelp, a uh, business a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, you know, Yelp still has a pretty good moat in like restaurant reviews. Um, you know, Google's doing well there, but I mean, Yelp is still commonly used for for you know, say, hey, did people like the food there or not? Um, it's just really, really hard to monetize. Really, really hard to monetize that business, especially with the competition from Google reviews. Um, and they historically had a pretty high cost um, customer acquisition model. Basically kind of, you know, kids out of college kind of, you know, smiling and dialing a whole bunch of small businesses to try and, you know, advertise with them. And when we invested, um, the company had articulated that they were gonna kind of ramp down that investment and focus more on like franchise businesses, like an Applebee's or a Jiffy Lube, where you know you talk to one person or two people at headquarters and you get a whole bunch of different locations. Sounds great, right? Uh, didn't actually happen. They basically said they were gonna do it and then did it. Um, and so, you know, kind of our thesis of more cost leverage didn't turn out to be right. And also just turned, it's just a harder business than we initially thought. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. and. What is your advice for people for when, when it's the right time to, you know, step away from a company you've been working at and to sort of start your own fund or your own sort of uh, financial venture and how to raise that initial capital? I mean, the failure rate, I mean, I mean, I, I think investment management is probably one of the few industries with a higher failure rate than restaurants. Um, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's really freaking hard. Uh, and I think most people just completely underestimate A, how hard it is and B, how how consuming the non-investment piece of it is going to be in your first few years, uh, possibly your first five to seven years, right? You know, whether it's capital raising, whether it's operational stuff, um, it's going to consume a lot of the time that you thought you'd be invested. Everyone has this image of like, you know, you know, Buffett with a partnership and just, you know, pouring our in and it's like, you know, he managed to find a few wealthy people to give money and it kind of worked out. If you happen to know like half a dozen friends who will, Give you enough money to support your lifestyle go for it right but absent that i think most people are way better off just finding an investment firm that matches who they are some people work out well in a small firm some people kind of like the larger resources of a, of a big well-established firm you know there's diff different investment styles different risk profiles uh different levels of concentration and i think most people like there's an aspect of running a firm that it's about being an entrepreneur, running a business. And just because you are a good investor, it doesn't necesarily mean you're a good business person, right? They are complementary, but not the same skill. And I think people often overestimate their ability of, as, a, as a good business person. Um, so, I mean, look, if you really got the yen, I mean, go for it. But it's gonna be harder than you think, especially raising capital. It's gonna be much harder than you think. Um, and you should really think hard about whether the re reward you're going to get multiplied by the probability of getting that reward, <laughs> the low probability, um, is, is, makes sense relative to the value of just networking your, the heck out of that, the, your, yourself to land at one of the half dozen shops you really want to be in, right? Maybe your time is better spent. I mean, Maybe there's, you know, you have some very specific style of investing you want to invest in. There's a very small number of firms that actually do that and they don't hire very often. Okay, well, get to know them. Like, make the investment, you know, reach out to them. And, you know, over a two, three, four year period, probably give you an opening at one of them, right? Um, you just got to be patient. And uh, we're trying to speak more about your investment process. Can you speak a little bit more? I know you spoke about it already a little bit, but a bit more about how you analyze management. How much do you look at things like insider ownership, insider buying and selling, those types of things? Um, yeah, I mean, look, more alignment's better than less alignment, you know, but you can't put founders on a pedestal. Um, I mean, the founder had the idea and he got the business from zero to 
100. Does it mean he or she is the right person to get it from 100 to 1,000? Um, he or she might be, but you can't assume that they are, right? So I think you need to analyze management skill and management alignment separately. I mean, they're, they're, they're just, they're very different. And frankly, there are, high, you know, one company we own, um, you know, the CEO, he was like the fourth or fifth person hired, but, you know, he doesn't have nearly this economic stake that a founder would, but he's been there almost since the beginning. Um, and he kind of feel, treats the company as if it were his own. So like, is he like, objectively, he's less aligned than a founder, but not really. You know what I mean? And so you, you kind of need to exercise some judgment on that. And look, I mean, the kind of companies we own, insider buying and selling doesn't mean a whole lot because they typically have these giant option packages. And so they're always doing 10B51 sales. And so like, you know, open market buys are like, you know, scares his hands teeth. Just, does, just doesn't communicate, just doesn't communicate all that much. I mean, when you see it, it's great, right? We had one company where, you know, a very involved board member, you know, kind of added to his stake kind of, you know, towards the body, you know, like the, early 2020, kind of when COVID was getting ugly, and it's like, oh, that's a pretty interesting signal. Um, but I, you can't wait around for those signals, right? Um, and, and management in general, I mean, our problem, I mean, everyone can do things, you can do things differently, but, you know, for us, management's maybe 30% of the equation and the business is the other 70. And some of that's just, I'm just probably better at analyzing businesses than people. Um, you know, but if you're gonna, if you wanna invest like, you know, the, in like the outsiders, right? and try to find the next Stainer or the next, you know, Constellation software or whatever, you better be a good, you better be real good at analyzing people, um, right? I mean, that's kind of mainly what you're doing. Uh, so it just kind of depends on what your skill set is. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And are there any industries that throughout the entire sort of life of Dorsey Asset Management you haven't invested in at all, either because they don't fit your investment philosophy or you feel like they're outside of your circle of competence? Yeah, auto parts. Life insurance, energy, mining, uh, commodity chemicals, and the list goes on and on. Utilities. Um, I mean, just you know, the, the 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 deep dark secret of the world is that most industries structurally are really tough, <laughs> uh, and this is not something the sell side wants you to wants you to know. And it's not something because you know, so many clients want diversification, right? They want to never be, you know, more than 300 bips over or underweight some, you know, what you know, every industry in the market or every sector of the market. Um, and that's fine, that, that's nothing, there's nothing normatively wrong with that. Um, but the reality is there aren't that many businesses that are structurally conducive to generating high and rising returns on capital. Just not, right? I mean, and that's kind of, when you, make, when you think about it, that kind of makes sense. The world shouldn't be full of monopolies, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, it makes sense that a lot of the world should be really competitive, right? And so, yeah, there's just tons and tons of things we just don't spend any time on. Um, I mean, if there's if the industry just doesn't really have a prayer of generating good businesses, then just why, 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 you know, it's just not our wheelhouse, right? They may be decent investments. I mean, if you're really if you're talented at figuring out commodity prices or you're talented at understanding cycles. Um, you know, it, you can make a ton of money buying, you know, you know, businesses that go from crappy to semi-crappy, <laughs> you know, at the bottom of the like, you can do really well with that. It's just not our wheelhouse. Um, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of stuff outside of our circle of confidence. You know, I mean, I, I think that you got to be really, especially in a concentrated, I mean, look, there's tons of companies that if we ran a 50 stock portfolio and like a big position was two and a half, three, we'd be totally spending time on them, right? But when like kind of a, a you know a medium sized position for us is like six or seven, and our chunky ones are like ten and twelve, um, if you get caught with your pants down, it's not fun. Uh, and so you really need to know what you're doing. You, you need to understand the business very well. And you know, I mean, I mean, we did a lot of work on Mercado Libre, right? Um, you know, it, it just has a lot of things that are very attractive about it. But as they began expanding the business into payments. Um, we're not on the ground in Brazil. We're not on the ground in Latin America. Understanding what are the different digital wallets that are being offered to different consumers every day. We're not interacting with merchants four and five times a day like you might be if you actually live there and gathering that data yourself just by living in that world. And then the world, 
couldn't do that, right? And so we're just, we're gonna be at a structural disadvantage to a lot of really intelligent managers who happen to live there. Um, so you gotta just kind of say, nope, that's not something we can spend, should be spending time on. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And you just touched a little bit on position sizing, but if you can expand a little bit about how you look at diversification, portfolio turnover, position sizing, number of positions, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, look, we don't, I mean, and again, this is us, right? Uh, I mean, we don't think about diversification at all. Um, I mean, we think about factor exposure, and I don't mean about quantitative factors, but I mean, you know, um, if your entire portfolio is exposed to some tail risk, well, it no longer is, it's no longer a tail risk. Right. It's a pretty, it's, it's kind of a large one. Uh, and so you want to think about kind of what, you know, what aspects of the world many businesses that you own are going to be potentially affected by. Uh, but that's quite different than kind of like GIX level diversification. Um, I mean, there's the old saw about, you know, you had the perfectly diversified portfolio um, in going into the GFC, you know, but the consumer company happened to be a home builder. The industrial company happened to sell plumbing and the finance company happened to do mortgages. Well, from a sector perspective, you were diversified, baby. Uh, but well, from your factor exposure, <laughs> not so much. Um, so it, you need to think about it a little bit more creatively. But yeah, we don't, I mean, I, but look, this all goes back to clients, right? This all goes back to, you know, what is the, what's the promise I've made to my clients, right? You know, like, like what, is, what is the product they're expecting to get, right? I mean, if you order a, a whisk on Amazon and get a toilet brush, you're not going to be real happy. Uh, it's kind of just didn't, wasn't what you want, right? And so if you communicate to invest to your clients that, you know, oh, I'm going to be kind of lower risk and I'm not going to have a lot of volatility, um, you know, and, you know, I'm going to do, I'm targeting 200 bits better than the market, whatever, whatever. If that's kind of what you promised and then over a couple of months, you're down 20, they're going to be asking you, wait, wait, I just got the toilet brush. <laughs> Where's the whisk? Um, but if you've communicated ahead of time, then look, like this is what we do. You know, we're long only. We're fully invested. Um, and there's going to be rough patches, right? I mean, we're going for the lumpy 15, not the smooth nine. Um, and if that's kind of the, you, you kind of agreed on that upfront with the client, first of all, you're going to get some good self-selection, right? Some clients are just going to say, nope, that's not what I want to sign up for. Just great for everybody. Um, you know, and then secondly, you just, you feel better about what you're doing because it's aligned with what you've promised to the client, right? Uh, and so I think it's really, you want to be really careful as an investor thinking like there's a right way to invest. Like there may be a way that you prefer to invest. I mean, it's right, right? And you also want to make sure that whatever way it is you prefer to invest, that's going to, you know, resonate most with you as a person and that you're kind of psychologically suited for, that's, that's aligned with your clients. Because that's when businesses get into, that's when investment firms get into real trouble, is when, you know, the way the firm invests isn't congruent with how it's communicated to its clients, right? Um, and you see this in the paper all the time, where, you know, I mean, people thought they were owning a money market fund and it turned out they were, you know, they owned a whole bunch of, you know, what was it? It was one of the Swiss banks like they had a whole bunch of collateralized loans collateralized by yachts or something you know it's just sort of like wait a minute that is not what you told me I was buying uh, that's an extreme example right um, but I just the alignment between what you're doing and what you want to do and what your clients think they're getting it's just it's so important and and I think that you know, the, 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 the character of your, not character, but the type of clients really shape who a firm is. And I think that's honestly something that not, people entering firms and trying to enter the profession, they don't pay enough attention to that. Like, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're trying to understand the soul of a firm, you want to understand, first of all, who are their clients? Like, what's their risk tolerance? What's their time horizon? You know, are they principals or are they agents? Huge difference, right? Um, because... Who the clients are is going to shape how the firm invests. It has to. Otherwise, the firm doesn't exist anymore. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, for a concluding question, uh, what have been the most influential events of your investing career? Oh, goodness me. Um, I 
it's a, that's a good one. Um, I, mean, I, would, I mean, I'll kind of go back to kind of my day one at Morningstar when um, my boss kind of dropped a whole bunch of books on my desk. You know, John Train's Money Masters and Common Stocks and Common Profits and, you know, just the usual stuff. But nobody, I, I didn't know it existed. You know, and it was like, oh, wow. This is how you, this is, this is what investing is? Wow, that's way more interesting than what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you know? um, so, I mean, if he hadn't done that, um, I don't know, path might have been very different. Uh, so that was, that was massively, influ that was massively influential. Um, and then, I don't know, I, I have a hard time pointing at any one event. because It's just, it's lots and lots of little things that help you realize who you are as an investor, how you want to invest, what you're not good at. Um, yeah, th th I don't know that there's any kind of one epiphany moment. Um, it's really, investing is a process of continuous self-discovery. You know, continuous understand of introspection and understanding who you are, what you're good at, what you're not good at, uh, what you want to be better at. <laughs> um, and, and just trying to push your time and your career towards the things that where you are a little bit better, right? You know, where, you know, you might have a little bit more skill than the person next to you. Um, and not getting back to a corner where you have no skill, you know, I mean, it, yeah, I, mean, I, I think that the old kind of know thyself thing is pretty, pretty important in this business. I think a lot of people spend way too much time looking at other investors and saying, that's who I want to be and not saying, does that match with who I am? Like, is the, could I have taken that action? Right. You know, does, 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 the way that person behaves in the world match with my own values. Um, and like, it's fine to learn from others and to learn from, you know, reading investor letters or, you know, watch, listen to podcasts or whatever it might be. But at the end of the day, you're either going to be pulling the trigger or making a recommendation to someone who's pulling the trigger more likely, right? Because there's just more, more analysts and PMs out there, you know? And if you don't have the courage and the conviction to make that recommendation and then stand behind it when you're wrong, when the chips are down, because you, it was kind of an idea that somebody else might've liked, but you just don't intellectual, you, you just don't um, emotionally agree with it. You're just gonna make bad decisions. Um, so yeah, I mean, you just, it's, you can't make investments that you don't, that don't, connect with who you are as a person and as an investor. Absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you so much. This was a really tremendous session and really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to meet with us today. All right. Take it easy. Thanks. Yep. Bye.